Hello Horror Hounds. Following his collaboration with George A. Romero on Two Evil Eyes in 1990, Trauma was Dario Argento's first full-length movie of the 90s and also his first feature film made by an American production company. I've talked about Two Evil Eyes previously so I'll link to that video in the description field and we'll forge ahead on our journey through the films of Dario Argento by jumping straight to Trauma. Ah, the 90s. What genre-defining horror director of the 70s and 80s has not languished in that decade's elephant graveyard of greatness? Truly only Wes Craven managed to climb out and, for better or worse, with Scream changed the direction of Western horror for the latter part of that decade and into the 2000s. For the rest, the 90s was a weird kind of Bermuda Triangle. As far as the films of Dario Argento are concerned, just like each successive series of American Horror Story fans agree that there was a drop-off in quality and brief returns to form, but exactly like American Horror Story, no one can agree exactly when each occurred and which is which. Many fans argue that uh, Tenebrae was Argento's last great film, uh, but Phenomena has its fans, and many including me go to bat for opera, and even uh, later films like The Stentile Syndrome and Sleepless have people claiming that they're returned to form. But Trauma gets very little love. Is it too American? Critics and apologists both zero in on the fact that this is Dario's first American production and jumped to the conclusion that he was restricted by producers and a Western commercial sensibility that sought to restrict his artistic flair and homogenize the maestro. But that explanation seems a little too pat, a little too convenient for me. After all, any fault you can find in trauma is present and correct in practically all of his films up to this point. Before a quick rewatch, of trauma that I hadn't seen for many years. I remembered it fondly and after watching it again I still have a soft spot for the film but I think we can all agree it wouldn't be put on a pull list of movies if you were trying to introduce a friend to his particular brand of heightened reality murder mystery serial killer in a fever dream genius. What the American production does mean is that the entirety of the audio is not recorded afterwards, as was the norm in Italian filmmaking. So the bad dubbing is out. It also provides roles for some well-known character actors, including the formidable Piper Laurie and the woefully underappreciated Brad Dourif. I know he's not underappreciated by us, the horror community. We all know how amazing he is. The world just doesn't seem to quite have caught up with that man's watery-eyed, twitchy brand of brilliance. The cons, though, is that the film was shot in and around Minneapolis, so trauma loses some of the flavour of the unfamiliar to Western eyes. And I realise that that's incredibly UK and US centric of me to say, but please give me a break, I'm a British guy who loves Italian horror movies. Part of the reason I love them is to see that clash between unfettered filmmaking and the faded, grandiose architecture and culture of a country that is sometimes haunted by its own past. There's a certain class-ridden and colonial Gothicism that is particular to my country with its castles and grand family mansions that have seen better days and are now houses to shadows, cobwebs and secrets. Italian horror is much showier, uh, much more modern and forward-looking uh, than the British Gothic that is concerned with the past, but there are still elements of Italian Gothic that are present. A ghost in the room, uh, which are concerned with the past of the country. Movies like The House with the Laughing Windows and Beyond the Darkness. Trauma, as with many of Argento's movies, is about a repressed past which breaks its bonds and comes screaming and homicidal into the present. A Minneapolis background sadly leeches all of that subtext out of the proceedings and the modern day insanity just seems to be taking place in any number of police procedural TV shows. With the anonymous setting comes an anonymous score. 
Uh, I've read that producers did veto Argento's use of longtime contributor Claudio Simonetti in favour of a score by Pino Donaggi, which would be more accessible to Western ears. And while I've seen some praise of Donaggi's score online, I found it to be as tepid and characterless as the setting of the movie. If Simonetti and his goblin bandmates could be relied on for anything, it was to inject some pulsing, pounding life into some of Argento's more anemic films. But what about the story itself? There's a lot to like here. Seances, a shady clinic trying to track down an escaped Aja Argento, a young man who helps her and gets drawn into the web of her life after her parents are killed by a black-gloved maniac who is collecting heads using a nifty automatic garrote wire machine. There are more talking decapitated heads in this movie than in all the rest of movie history put together and the special effects are by a certain Mr. Tom Savini. Trauma is notable for being far more character driven than most of Argento's films and he's been criticised in the past and the present for caring more about his spectacular set pieces than he does about his actors or plot yet funnily enough when he does sacrifice the visual flair for character development as he does in Trauma and previously in Cat and Nine Tales well he's criticised for doing that as well. If Phenomena was a film about a mysterious killer fused onto the story of a girl who could talk to insects, then Trauma is a film about a mysterious killer that's fused onto a hallmark true life movie of the day about a young orphaned anorexic girl and her ex-drug addict partner who stops her from committing suicide and promptly becomes addicted to the notion that he can save her. It's not as fluffy as that, but some people take real exception to all these characters and feelings and issues that are suddenly in a Dario Argento movie. To be fair, the plot does see a whirl of great character actors on the fringes of the story doing their damnedest to bolster up, let's be kind and say, slightly more immature performances by the two leads. Some people buy it, some don't. And maybe to some extent your patience with trauma as a whole, rather than just a film that's got some good Argento bits in it, will rely on how much you buy into the central relationship and the central performances. Because I have no doubt in my mind at all, this feels like the most personal film he has ever made. To explain why we have to talk briefly about anorexia, Aja Argento's character, Aura, is anorexic. And whilst the armchair psychology is laughable, it's important to understand that the character was inspired by her half-sister, Anna, Daria Nicolodi's daughter from a previous marriage, who actually suffered from anorexia. The girl dancing over the end credits, beatified in bright white light in the way that David Lynch sometimes likes to do, is Anna herself. You can watch her painfully thin over the end credits. And aside from an unnecessary swipe at Nickelodeon herself, some psychobabble nonsense about anorexic girls having overbearing mothers, the personal family pain at the heart of this movie is at times unbearable when you know it exists. Doubly so when you find out that Anna died in a traffic accident shortly after the film was released. The strange seeming completely out of place end credit sequence now seems like a eulogy to a lost stepdaughter and half-sister. While some may scoff at the seemingly ham-fisted dealings of a real-world problem within a film about someone slicing people's heads off, I'm minded to tread a little more lightly. I see family members reaching out, perhaps clumsily, trying to let a sick relative know that they understand, or are at least trying to understand. I'd rather grandly call the next section of my notes the French Revolution and the Sexual Revolution. The film opens with a cardboard cutout diorama of a guillotine scene from the French Revolution that is explained away 
at the end of the film. And since his very first film, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, the subtext of the sexual revolution and the new liberated woman has always been bubbling under the surface of his movies. His male protagonists from the 70s are usually undermined and deconstructed and make way in the 80s for female protagonists. In Trauma, the suppressed and repressed revolt of vengeance is much like the terror of the French Revolution, which took the heads of the ruling classes and those in positions of power. Let me quote from Linda Badley and an essay she published on Kinoi.org in an essay entitled Talking Heads, Unruly Women and Wound Culture, Dario Argento's Trauma. The film's issues are the stuff of female gothic and 1990s trauma culture. Anorexia, bulimia, nervosa, dysfunctional mother-daughter relationships, oppressive medical institutions, malpractice cover-ups, recovered memories, incest and false memory syndrome. The pop psychology usually left by Argento to subtext or used to wrap an already baroque finale trauma foregrounds and then develops in its case study of a suicidal anorexic and trauma enacted upon women by institutions and quasi-abusive relationships with male medical professionals. Later, when David describes Aura's symptoms to Arnie, a perpetually noshing junk food addict, the latter diagnoses her as an anorexic, rattling off the profile in about 30 seconds. How do you know all of this? David asks. Don't you watch Donahue and Oprah, Arnie incredulously replies, adding after a long glance at the soap opera playing on the screen, you should be watching that thing and eating this stuff. Arnie's equation of television news, the weather, talk shows, soap operas, commercials and junk food has direct bearing on trauma's more obvious issues. Television provides pop psychological diagnoses, which it passes off as solutions to the social problems it creates and feeds. Thank you, Linda Badley, for an academic approach <laughs> to trauma. But enough of that highfalutin stuff. Let's talk about lizards. Dario's favourite spirit animal makes yet another appearance. Lizards and butterflies. I feel that over the course of a number of movies, we're piecing together a key to understanding part of Argento's symbolic landscape. We have an inquisitive boy called Gabriel who lives next door to the killer in what many have said is a nod to Rear Window, but I see a little more of Fright Night in it. Gabriel is an amateur lepidopterist. He loves butterflies and so joins the ranks of Argento's forces of good alongside Jennifer from Phenomena and Betty, who at the end of Opera finds an affinity with the insect world. Phenomena also keyed us into the mythological link between the butterfly and the human soul and psyche. And we get another shot of a butterfly being eaten by a lizard, first seen in a strange montage in Inferno. In my video for Inferno, I talked how the lizard was aligned to the evil three mothers in the architecture of Mater Tenebrarum's building. Here the lizard is adopted by the killer and once again the reptilian is aligned with madness and evil. Rain again makes an appearance. We've talked before about water infusing many of Argento's movies, a recurring symbol that he links to murder, mayhem and chaos. Rather than it being a purely stylistic choice in trauma now, there's a very definite reason why the killings are linked to water and in particular rainfall. It all links back to the repressed past, which figures heavily in a lot of Argento's jelly, and the motivation of the killer. The motive, oh my god, quite possibly one of the most <laughs> horrific things committed to film ever. We've talked a lot in the past about Dario Argento and his representations of homosexuality and it's interesting to see how the lesbian couple here are dealt with completely differently to the lesbian couple in Tenebre. Not sexualized at all, just a working, functioning, normal relationship. Whilst I think there was a purpose to the sexualization of the lesbian couple in Tenebre, a rather pointed jab at the genre, those trying to emulate him and his critics, it's good to see him maturing. So is it any good? Well, it's solid, but not remarkable. The occasional clinical or hospital setting, the medical professional victims, and of course, 
the presence of Brad Dourif gives me Exorcist 3 Deja Vu vibes in some places. Trauma is nowhere near as accomplished as Exorcist 3. There's a truly great Argento movie in amongst the rubble somewhere, the muddle. I feel like I've said a similar thing about uh, Phenomena, and like Phenomena there are some truly outstanding moments. Images, the conscious heads, Nicholas's bedroom and the motive, oh my God, the motive. If it hadn't been a Dario Argento film, I think Trauma would have joined the ranks of the early 90s killer thrillers, some uh, sleazy addition uh, to smatter the early CVs of the likes of James Spader or Bridget Fonda. As a Dario Argento film, expectations are naturally set somewhat higher. But is that fair? Trauma was released 23 years after The Bird with the Crystal Plumage. What other young director has kept his or her fire for that long over so many films without losing what made them fresh and exciting? Regardless of what you think about Argento's quality filmmaking or when it ended, it's clear that he himself wasn't quite ready to hang up the black gloves because his next film would be the troubling The Stendhal Syndrome.